you're so good with tech technical things, which is uh, awesome. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few bloopers the last few weeks. Oh. But um, trial and error, it's all about trial and error, I think. Yeah, I was telling Kylie about it. I was like, no, the last time I did uh, the class with uh, Kirsty, you know, I really liked it because it was on Zoom, but live on Facebook. Yeah. So that was good. Oh, here we go. Okay, so we're live on there. I'll just turn that off and then hopefully um, hopefully the sound won't bounce back. So, um, yes, Bula, it's so good to see you again and to be um, doing this collaborative Talanoa across the ocean and a few bits of land in between here and there. <laughs> um, yes ha so yeah happy saturday to everyone else who is watching or happy friday depending on what time zone you're in because you're still friday aren't you there yes yeah still friday yes so nice so um yeah we're going to kind of continue on from the um, top story that we did a few weeks ago or it's a month ago now um yes. and talk about um early early times in Oceania. So I'm um, thinking about early human migrations into the Pacific. I'll share my screen mm -hmm. so that they can see the PowerPoint. Um, can you see that too, Tarisi? Yes, I can okay. see it. Awesome. Um, and I'll put slideshow on. Okay, so there's um, our opening. Oh, and um, so yeah, hopefully everyone who's watching saw the first um, top story that we did, but for those who don't know us yet, this is Dr. Tarisi Budindilo and she is based at um, University of Hawaii Hilo campus. And I'm Dr. Kirsty Close. I'm down in Melbourne in Australia and currently doing some teaching for Deakin University. Um, but I run a business called History's Way and that's where this is getting streamed to and then Dr. Tarisi, you'll be posting it on your pages, right? Because you've been super active teaching people on Facebook as well. Um, and you have a YouTube channel too, don't you now? Yes, I do. I have a YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, thanks for the last uh, video that you uh, sent me. So I've also put it up on uh, the YouTube channel as well. Yay. Good. I know you've been getting lots of viewers, so that's really exciting. Um, yeah, so this will be the next instalment and I think we're still planning on doing a third. Yes. That's the plan. So um, in this in this talk story, I'm going to talk a little bit about prehistory and that concept uh, and how I have issues with it, <laughs> really. And then um, looking at the evidence that we have um, as scholars and people interested in history and archaeology, um, yeah, looking at early human migration into Oceania. So a lot of it is about theories that people have put forward so that we can understand what happened. Um, I don't know, do you ever get frustrated that we won't ever really know for sure where people have come from? Absolutely, uh, <laughs> Dr. Kirsty. Yeah, that's uh, uh, very frustrating for scientists, you know, uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, linguists, uh, botanists, and also frustrating for, um, you know, our own indigenous communities, because everyone wants to know, you know, exactly uh, where and when, uh, where everyone came from, and how did they get here. And so, um, what I often encourage my people, when I say my people, I refer to our Itoke communities in Fiji, is to have that um, broad understanding of knowing um, how science works and okay. how uh, scientific fields work. You know, we can pinpoint exactly, we kind of give like a time frame, or we say uh, this may be the place. So we used a lot of those words, like maybe, possibly, um, all those kind of words to uh, uh, reassure our indigenous people that definitely we came from somewhere. Yeah. But I think we need to have that patience, I think, you know, to allow uh, our scientists to also collaborate with our own indigenous stories in order for us to understand our prehistory better. Yes, yeah, and there's been some amazing 
um, work done, where, which kind of links those two, well, many multiple um, knowledge systems together, right? So yes. that's, that's been exciting. Um, and I think it was you who was telling me about, or maybe it was something that I read about a community in Western Australia where it had talked about an eruption and it kind of, um, there was scientific evidence found about it as well as the local um, oral mm -hmm. traditions about it. So it all kind of matches up really well. Um, yeah, I get so excited by that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's a term prehistory, which I've come across, and I would actually love to hear your thoughts on this, um, Dr. Tarisi, but um, yeah, the term prehistory, I think is a bit problematic and people have started to chip away at it. Um, mm. Often historians and archaeologists will use this to describe the era prior to European colonization of, um, of an area. And so in this, in this talk, we're looking at Oceania. Mm. Um, it kind of suggests that there's a disconnect between the before and after of that moment and suggests that that's a really important moment and almost puts maybe too much importance on it. Um, so that's one of my issues with it because there's all this stuff that goes on that flows and Europeans are just one part of the story, you know. Mm. Um, and it doesn't necessarily give that much legitimacy to the stuff that happened prior to Europeans arriving either. Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of feeds into ideas about societies that were non-European being somehow lesser. And so um, historians have started to talk about the deep past more and um, show that there's a bigger picture of human histories. Um, is this something that you've been thinking about as well? Absolutely, uh, Dr. Kirsty. Um, you know, one thing that uh, often, um, I think I like what you mentioned earlier on, which is absolutely true, where, you know, the indigenous communities or the non-European communities were looked upon as lesser. And I think, uh, it, it is really true because it seems like the the past before the Europeans arrived is sort of like either dismissed or being erased. Uh, I don't know whether there can be, uh, was it a deliberate move? Um, you know, why did that happen? But also the indigenous voices are kind of like, um, you know, not put with a lot of uh, importance. Just to give you an example, as you and I both know about Tupaya, you know, he was the Tahitian navigator that was on one of the boats uh, with Captain James Cook. So he knew all the islands to the west of Tahiti. You know, they gave him a pen and there was a paper and he drew all the islands, including the island of Rotuma, mm. you know. And to me, if Tupaya, who is from Tahiti and is right on the eastern side, and he knew all the islands to the west, and that means it's so much navigation knowledge, so much celestial knowledge, so much geographical knowledge that was not taken seriously. You know, it was more like the European voices was given much more voice or much more volume. Mm -hmm. um, so I thank you, uh, Dr. Kirsty, for, you know, creating this Talanoa platform for you and I, you know, to be able to um, you know, give voice, I think, for many of our Indigenous listeners so that they can feel empowered to know, hey, your past is just as important as those written, you know, um, history that were written by non-Oceanian uh, people. So, yeah, I totally uh, believe and agree with what you said because that's been um, bothering me for a number of years. Uh, the other one, too, if I can add, is the importance of place names, uh, Dr. Kirsty. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, there's so much power into that. And that's something I've been encouraging my little Fijian children, you know, when I uh, teach my online classes is to appreciate the names of their tribes, uh, even their family names, like their own surnames. They have meanings. Yeah. You know? Oh, mm. that's cool. So, yeah, there's, I think there's a push across the region to have more um, respect and acknowledge more the place names that have come before. You know, and there's so many layers of history 
that um, existing side by side that we need to kind of make it more complicated than what it has been. Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's part of um, the challenge for us now living in societies that have been colonized and trying to pay respect. Um, yeah, anyway, that's, I'm so glad we're having this conversation as well because that's just, anyway, there's lots, there's lots to be said. Um, so I suppose spinning off from that a little bit too, um, often both of our disciplines um, would love to periodize history or break it down into sections so that you can think through um, different um, time frames. Mm. So many people have tried this and um, and this leads people into the trap of categorizing people. Um, and anthropologists have tried to categorize people, for example, by the ways in which their societies functioned. Although I think that all disciplines do this too. Mm. Um, like looking at whether a society is capitalist or not, mm. um, uses certain types of money or like barter systems. Um, historians such as Andrew Shryrock and Daniel Small have encouraged historians to look beyond the, those categories and um, have said that that kind of is damaging for our ways of understanding differences between our societies too. So there is this discussion going on in the literature, not just between you and I. <laughs> just oh, good. Off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I I was looking into this. I should also say, like I know I've said this to you, but these are slides that I've used when I've been teaching for um, Pacific Adventist University in Papua New Guinea. So these are kind of going to lead us into discussions that that focuses a lot on PNG. But hopefully we can. Um, expand out. I'm so glad you've talked about Tupaya because he's um, amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of how history has been categorized previously. There's the prehistory, ancient, medieval, um, early modern and modern. Um, yeah. I've just been watching Game of Thrones for the first time, Tarisi, so I just feel like I'm even though it's all <laughs> fantasy stuff, I feel like I'm in a medieval mind frame. But anyway, just that's that's not important. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then we've got um, nomadic societies, agricultural and industrial too. Those are another forms of categories that have been used. Um, and interestingly, in Australia, we're having a real big shift at the moment in the way that Australia's Indigenous communities are seen because for such a long time, they were depicted in histories as being nomadic. Mm -hmm. um, but now there's more and more evidence to show you that there was much more agricultural kind of work going on, that wow. communities were much more settled. Um, mm -hmm. And it just kind of increases our understanding of how much knowledge they had of the land and how to use it. Mm. So, um, so it's been kind of exciting. There's been a, a few really great books come out about that in the last little while. Um, so yeah, these are not like fixed categories. Once you put us, um, people into these categories, there's always scope for that to change mm. depending on how research spins off too. Um, okay, and I think you broke down the different parts of the Pacific um, as it's been called pretty well last time. So I won't go over it, but here's a nice map of Oceania and mm -hmm. the areas in which we talk about. Um, okay, so those divisions, again, I think you've gone over that pretty well. Um, but what I might do is put these slides up at some stage so that people can look through them if they want all the extra information. Yes. Um, and so, like I said, there's been some discussions amongst academics about um, decolonizing oceanic histories. Um, and part of that has been like what you were saying, calling the region Oceania instead of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about near Oceania or remote Oceania. Um, and those terms, um, RC Green has said, reflect better the early movement of people into the region, like in two mm -hmm. waves. Um, so kind of trying to get rid of the 
divisions that have been brought in by Europeans over the last couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, so like we were saying, researchers keep finding new material to try and piece together these stories. And what we know roughly is that migration was originally helped because there was much larger land masses. So um, Sahul and Sunda, the two big land masses around um, that joined um, Papua New Guinea and Australia together, for example, meant that people had easy access down further south than they do now. Um, migration continued by boat and stuff after they split apart and the oceans rose up a bit higher, but um, that definitely helped. And I think the next slide, oh no, I don't have it. I thought I had a map of Sahul and Sunda, but um, maybe that's something else I can post later too. Um, but the theory at this stage or when I last checked was that remote Oceania was inhabited about 10,000 years ago mm. and then near Oceania about 35,000 years ago, so much earlier. Um, mm. And then places like Papua New Guinea were settled in both of those migration waves. Um, so here's the map of near Oceania and then the more remote one um, with the earlier and later migrations and settlements. Um, I struggle with this map because the lines are kind of vague, but I suppose mm. that kind of reflects our vague knowledge about, <laughs> about some of this stuff. Um, mm. um, and then I think this might be a map that you used last time too, showing the movement of people out from Africa and, mm. and the debates about how, um, yeah, human patterns of movement out um, through Europe and Asia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, here's Sahul and Sunda. So oh, you can see, yes. yeah, yes. those parts of Asia that were joined and stuff. Um, this is really like you're much more in your comfort zone in these deeper parts of history. Is there anything that you want to add at this point? Mm. Yes, I want to really acknowledge the archaeologists uh, from the Australian uh, National University. Um, so these are some of the names I remembered when I was studying there uh, way back in 1996, like a long time ago. Um, uh, Professor <clears throat> Peter Bellwood, um, Dr. Ethel Anderson, and I think there was um, Greg Summerhays. Um, these are some of the names I remember. They did a lot of work, particularly in the Indonesian region. Um, Peter Bellwood is such a, he was one of my teachers. I was so blessed to have him in my class. Um, you know, he was such a very humble man. He's written so much about um, Oceania before he started moving westwards into um, the Philippines and the Indonesian region. And that to me, um, the archeological evidence really connected very well with the flora and fauna because there are also some studies done by, you know, our scientists who study, you know, the, the biologists and the botanists and also language. That was another part as well, because there's also Dr. Andrew Polly uh, from ANU as well. So I have really been following a lot of the amazing work that they've done. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Andrew Polly ended up coming to Fiji and he actually helped write one of the, the dictionary for the islands of Yasawa and the district of um, the, uh, the province of Ba. So I think out of the whole of Fiji, we have dictionaries for the whole of the country, but Andrew Polly actually helped write uh, the dictionary for the Asawa, uh, for the Asawa people. So they're really blessed that way. But coming back here, uh, you know, when I teach the, this part of uh, our prehistory, it's quite exciting when you get students to uh, picture, you know, animals, because, you know, when the, the two places, you know, divided, some of the animals that you can find on Sahul is also find, you know, in Sunda. And um, they wouldn't just appear on their own, but for some reason, uh, the plants are similar. It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, if I can make it simpler for those of you who are listening in to understand that the whole geology of the whole world um, was sort of like a jigsaw puzzle when things started moving apart. Actually, when they started breaking away, animals um, that were on that part moved with a piece of land and that equals 
the remaining part that left behind. So when you actually learn and understand how the geology happened and how flora and fauna um, became evidence of such move, it's very, very exciting. And you kind of realize how much that was happening on this earth thousands and even millions of years ago. Very yeah. exciting. I keep thinking about the movie Ice Age now too, you know, how they have yes. <laughs> anyway. uh, So you can see my brain's in pop culture at the moment. Um, lots of cartoons, but um, I can also just picture all these little animals like waving goodbye to their friends as they the land splits apart. But um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it is like a big jigsaw puzzle and it's cool yeah. when you get these graphics that show like kind of an idea of what it was like mm -hmm. and you can visualize it more yes. um yeah so um okay so i'm going to use png as an example again and then maybe i can get you to fill in some of the fijian um mm -hmm. details um dr tarisi but about thirty thousand years ago they think people were settling on the islands of new britain and out in the eastern parts of what's now Papua New Guinea, um, like around New Ireland. And this is kind of in that late Pleistocene era. I hope I've pronounced that properly because that's probably changed mm -hmm. too since I was at school. Um, and then about 21,000 years ago, they think people settled on Manus Island. Um, 9,000 years ago, there's some evidence of agriculture starting up in the highlands. And then um, this is where it gets exciting for me because starting to think about specific trees and plants and stuff, which I know you would love as well. But um, <laughs> beetle nut was around 5,800 years ago. And then um, there's signs of trade in bird of paradise skins and sugar cane as well traded with Asia. Um, and then another thing you'll know a lot about is 3,500 years ago with Lapita pottery um, from the north coast and then sweet potato um, introduced into the highlands they think about 400 years ago mm -hmm. um, so what do you remember the kind of time frames with Fiji yes um, so for Fiji the particularly the Lapita pottery um, so around 3000 <clears throat> years ago um, was the evidence or the um, the radiocarbon dating that came back through uh, the work by Dr. Simon Best on the island of La Kemba, um, the work done at the Sinotoka Sand Dunes, as well as the Natanuku in Ba, um, and also when we worked in uh, um, in Yasawa on the island of Waia, uh, we also found Lapita on uh, Waia Lay, like the smaller Waia, and uh, very interesting to see. So for Fiji, um, the the archaeological times went back to the Lapita pottery uh, findings that you see there. So definitely you can see that we are much, much younger, uh, mm -hmm. geologically speaking uh, and archaeologically speaking compared to Papua New Guinea. Um, but one thing I want to highlight here is going back to the 9,000 years ago with agriculture, mm -hmm. because from a geological timeline, that's the Holocene period. Yeah, so you mentioned the Pleistocene and then the next one for 10,000. Uh, is Holocene. And that was sort of when they start talking about the Little Ice Age um, and how, you know, the world started um, from the Ice Age era, it started warming up. And to me, it makes sense. So if you look at it straight after that, uh, and a thousand years later, agriculture, you know, started to develop. So definitely for plants, uh, it needs the right climate, the right type of soil, uh, you need proper rainfall in order to have um, agriculture um, you know, revolution to actually take place. And Papua New Guinea definitely through the Cook uh, site um, in Papua New Guinea, which is actually the first World Heritage Site of the region uh, that is registered under UNESCO. So yeah, so that's really, really exciting there, Dr. Kirsty. Mm. Yeah, oh, for sure. I think, I don't think I've actually got anything about the Cook site here, but um, Oh man, yeah, you would have a lot to say about it. I know, I think we've talked yes. about it in the past. Um, it is exciting. Yeah, I mean, and then- Yeah, I'm glad you included it there with that uh, 9,000 years bra uh, uh, bracket that is there. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And then maybe in the next um, 
talk story we can talk about Lavuka as well yes it's another ripper <laughs> mm. um and so um one of the books that I read when I was working up these slides was one by John Waiko who's written the history of Papua New Guinea um he's such a um uh, an amazing person and <laughs> if you've ever heard him present he's an amazing presenter as well um he scared me once because he started singing right in my face at the start of a presentation and I was not expecting it at all but <laughs> anyway very interesting so he um has referred to Les Groob's work on the Huon Peninsula um mm. and looked at these wasted axes um and they use luminescence dating with these ones. I know you mentioned radiocarbon dating. So do you want to explain yeah. what the difference is for people who are not so sure? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so for those of you who are listening in, the uh, radiocarbon dating um, depicts or, or, or is the evidence of the presence of carbon um, in many of the artifacts that we excavate. Um, so that would include, um, you know, charcoal, uh, human bones, uh, rocks and adzes and uh, uh, shell ornaments. So things that were mainly, you know, living things that uh, would definitely have um, carbon present in them. Um, so many of the archaeologists, if they had worked in Papua New Guinea in this case, they would um, put samples uh, of things that they find um, whether it's, uh, you know, rock samples or uh, human bone samples or charcoal samples, and then they send it to a laboratory. So normally the labs, they do all the uh, analysis. Uh, so if any of you watches CI, uh, criminal investigation, I always do. My family know I love watching that. Um, and then anything documentary that has mystery in it, I love watching them. And so you'll see, you know, when they do the CI or criminal investigation, they take all this uh, DNA testing, they take it to special labs. So very, very similar. So it's quite exciting, you know, when the lab results are sent back and then they try and uh, give a time frame, uh, time frame of how long a place has been uh, inhabited. So yeah, a lot of work done in the field. So we have to make sure when you're working in the field, that the whatever sample that you are bagging and putting into bags and labeling them should not be contaminated. So you might be thinking, oh, what does contaminating mean? That means uh, if you're a smoker, you are not allowed to be standing near where they are actually taking samples because that can contaminate the oh, yeah. samples that you're taking. Yeah, very interesting. So normally we will always tell those who want to smoke to go far away so that we can be able to do the bagging of, you know, stone edges and um, charcoal and bones and shells, things like that. Mm. I would never have thought of that, but of course that would be an issue. Yep. Um, thankfully I'm not a smoker, so that would not be, I would not get into any trouble with you on that. <laughs> <Phew>. <laughs> Um, okay, so a little bit more about betel nut. Um, so that last bit was about artifacts um, that some archaeologists have found. And then um, there was this guy, Pitt Rivers, who came in, um, he was a researcher, and he came up with his own theory about how Oceania was inhabited by looking at betel nut. Um, and he, he explained it as there was parts of the Pacific that um, where people chewed betel nut and then other parts where they don't and where they more, are more likely to drink kava. So that mm. was his way of explaining um, differences across the region. Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Like, do you think this is a good way to think about people migrating and why, like, the different um, patterns of society setting up or mm. not so yeah. <laughs> Um Yeah, this is interesting, you know, particularly when you have, you know, anthropologists or uh, archaeologists to um, come up with their own conclusion uh, based on plants. Mm. Um, interesting, you know, you mentioned about sweet potatoes. Again, it was very debatable in um, archaeological conferences. Sometimes, you know, even archaeologists 
they have confrontations among themselves, you know, because one will be saying, no, sweet potatoes came from South America. And then someone else said, no, it came from, you know, Asia. So on the other side of the, the of Oceania. Um, and so, you know, Pete Rivers in this case, you know, he has every right to his opinion. Um, but, you know, I find it interesting that, you know, the cover culture has to come from the other side of Oceania, oh, while yeah. he says that the bill did not come from the other side. Um, you know, there's still room uh, to kind of contribute to this debate, and I'd love to, uh, you know, write maybe from a cover perspective, because now I'm a cover farmer, <laughs> and uh, uh, my family in Fiji, um, you know, they also have cover farms, and I'm now into researching more about kava, uh, which is very interesting because it actually goes back through to Vanuatu and to Papua New Guinea, which is kind of another interesting place because these two places have uh, some original um, sort of species of kava. Um, so that'll be interesting to find out how the kava came there you know, did it come from South America or did it come via Southeast Asia? So yeah, I'd love to, um, you know, share more, maybe in our next talk story. Yeah. Uh, in okay. order to, yeah, to add more to this because cover, you know, today it's such a, a hot topic because it's one of a, a very highly uh, paid commodity. Um, it's everyone wants cover these days because it's got a lot of healing properties. Mm. So I think at this time is really just to acknowledge our ancestors for um, yeah, keeping the knowledge alive. And uh, it's sort of like the gift, right? They left a gift for us, uh, this generation today. And hopefully you and I can inspire the next generation for them to you know, take a lot of their tree knowledge seriously, you know, learn more about the big nut culture, learn yeah. about cover the cover culture because we can learn more about ourselves through these plants. Exactly. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah, there's so much to say again. But yeah, hope we'll have to think. Okay, so Lavuka and Kava for the next talk story. <laughs> there are two <laughs> things on the list already. Yes. But, definitely. Um, yeah, I think um it's been in the news here too because um they're talking about um lifting some of the um, restrictions around carver imports I mm. think so um, it has been in the news I have to research that a little bit more because it's been happening through lockdown and I just haven't been able to pay as much attention as I should <laughs> but um but yes I love I love that you're doing that research I would love to hear more about that from you Yes, definitely. And we're learning a lot of the Hawaiian cover species. I think they have 13 uh, here wow. in Hawaii. Yeah, so everywhere, all the farmers that we go and talk to, um, I get to interview them and then they show me the different uh, types and the names. Um, and so I share it with my brother, who is a cover farmer in Fiji. And so he was saying to me the other day, hey, can you share your uh, research with me? Because here in Fiji, we just look at cover like all the same but yeah. they're actually differences and their names uh, for each species and so I told him yeah I'll definitely share it with you and other farmers so that uh, they can you know when they're planting they know which which uh, cover species they're planting and why certain cover species has more cover lactones than others so mm -hmm. the cover lactones are the ones that scientists go for because they are the ones that has a lot of healing properties okay Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. No, this is a very, very interesting topic. Okay. But yes, we'll push it off until next, um, the next talk story, because I think there's so much. Yes, there's so much to say. Oh, yeah. Here's, so here's Pit, Pit Rivers beetle line. And like you said, there's that argument about stuff coming from South America, and uh -huh. stuff coming from Asia. So there's that um, kind of meeting point around Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to the east of the Solomon Islands. Yes. And, um, yeah. Um, so that's that. And then, like you were saying too, the sweet potato has had a similar, similar discussion happening around it. Um, so they mm. think that the sweet potato was um, brought in not from the southeast, but from the Bismarck Archipelago. So it's kind of like yeah. a scoop around. So it kind of challenges some of those ideas that it might have come down through Asia mm. directly. 
Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And then here's some of the plotting that they've done around the different types of um, potatoes. Um, and like you said, there's all these different types of kava. This is kind of untangling some of the, mm. um, the sweet potato types and varieties. Um, Yes, yeah. absolutely. And that's to me, you know, one thing I really admire about Papua New Guinea, you know, the agricultural revolution, you know, was there, you know, in Papua New Guinea. And when you think about it, you know, it goes back, um, you know, all the way to Babylon. You know, there was a lot of attention and focus on the other side of the globe about the agricultural revolution that happened there. Yes. But when you think about it, hey, we also had our own agricultural revolution in our own neck of the woods, you know, here yes. in Oceania and in Papua New Guinea. So again, another reminder of how important our history is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but such an exciting way of thinking about it and of challenging mm. that importance that's been placed on the Northern Hemisphere kind of yes. histories. There's so much more that can be said and, and thought about from down here for sure. Um, and then, so the next thing I had was about linguistic heritage too. And um, there's so much diversity in language mm. across the region, let alone in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Papua New Guinea is its whole other thing. Um, but there's that's been divided yeah. into Austronesian and non-Austronesian languages. Um, and so again, I'm going to refer to John Lyco. Mm. So he explained it in a way I thought was qu quite clear, which was good. Um, and he said that those languages have been used to explain that Papua New Guinea's highlands were occupied in the first wave of human migration yes. um, and they're the Austronesian speaking peoples and then the second wave to arrive who settled mostly around the coast when speaking non-Austronesian languages so that's one of the ways in which they've thought about um, those human movements too. Wow. Yeah so with Fiji what's the what's the theory with language for for VT, yes, for for VT, uh, definitely. If I remember one of the papers that was written by Dr. Paul Garrity, uh, really want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Paul. Um, he has done for Fiji. Um, the I remember in one of his maps that he drew, he actually drew a line diagonally across Fiji. So to him, there's an Eastern um, kind of uh, languages and there's a Western. Um, so the Western dialects or the Western languages was more the older one. Um, and then the Eastern side is more the younger one, which uh, in a lot of ways, it kind of um, goes logical evidence as well. Uh, because on the Western side of Fiji, so that would include uh, the provinces of Mba, Ra, uh, Nanronga, Serua, Namosi, uh, Neta Siri, um, they have a, a version of the languages that they use. Uh, but on the eastern side, which includes a lot of the outer islands, uh, that would include Vanuolevu um, and the Lao uh, province, Kandavu, uh, most of our languages has a lot of uh, affinity to Polynesia. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of our dialects, even for me, some of my dialects from Kandavu um, has a lot of uh, Tongan influence in it, um, which kind of signifies the younger, um, you know, element that is associated with it. For example, you know, words like morning um, in Fiji, like the, in, in Kandavu where I'm from, uh, we call it bongi bongi. Yeah, bongi bongi. But in the Tongan, it's pongi pongi. You just change the, you know, the first uh, letter from P uh, and B. And so um, that kind of uh, explains, you know, supporting what uh, John Waiko said. Definitely for Fiji, there are different waves of migration, uh, which uh, um, has evidence through archaeology uh, and also through language too. Mm. Mm, that's so interesting because. I haven't actually thought about it like that. I knew that there was a strong Tongan influence over the east um, with Ma'afu and that kind of pre-colonial period. But yes. um, thinking about the deeper history of it, I hadn't really thought about it as a sign of those human migration movements. So that's really interesting. 
Yes, yeah. definitely. Yes. So for me, you know, when you look at language, uh, it really uh, reaffirms with me um, that the re mm -mm. Let me still running. Are you still there? Dr. Tarisi. Is it me who dropped out of her? Tarisi. Mm -mm. I don't know if I'm still streaming. I think Dr. Tarisi might have dropped out. Oh, internet. Okay, there's just a little bit more to go. Um, that's one of the maps that shows the different, um, some of the different language families in Papua New Guinea. Oh, she has gone. What a shame. Um, sorry, everybody. And then we're going to talk about Lapita Pottery too. Um, oh, here we go. Hello, are you there? Yes, I think my internet. Oh, okay. I was wondering if it was yours or mine. Yeah, I think it's mine because sometimes it goes um, goes down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mine mine has been playing up a little bit this week, so I was a bit worried, but um, okay. I'm glad that yes, you I'm came sure back. You I'm so glad you're back. Yes. I um, I just skipped through some more slides about language and have skipped to the Lapita pottery section because we'll have to finish soon so that we don't um, don't make everyone go to sleep or run out everyone's data okay. down and all that sort of thing <laughs> um yes. uh with lapita pottery um i know you've done work on this um with your archaeological research do you want to talk a little bit about that because i think that's much more interesting than anything i can say about it okay sure yes so for the lapita pottery um as you mentioned there on the screen there it's uh, dated to uh, three thousand years ago and this was done through um, um, radiocarbon dating. So a lot of you may be wondering, how come they come up with that date? So it's through the uh, hard work of uh, archeologists who've ex excavated a lot of sites uh, all the way to Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, uh, Vanuatu, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. So those are the islands that has, and New Caledonia, definitely. Um, that's where all the Lapita potteries are found. So the features of Lapita pottery, it's reddish in color. So you can see the picture here, uh, it's kind of reddish. And some of the designs of the Lapita pottery is actually on the outside surface, but also on the inner uh, surface of the, of the pot. So that makes it um, uh, unique and makes it special as well. Uh, because some of the pots that we have today, they are plain or they have different types of uh, designs and patterns, but the Lapita, one fact is that it's reddish. So that's the color that you see. And the second one is the design, but also the type of design. So the design is very, very fine. So according to the archeologists, they use something like a, a fine tooth comb. That's how best they can uh, describe the, the tool that was used um, for uh, this type of Lapita pots. Now, the thing with the Lapita pots, the word Lapita actually come originally from the Kanaks in New Caledonia. Oh. So it was in Kone in New Caledonia where um, the word um, Lapita uh, came from. And so the pottery was named as that. Um, and so the, some of the sizes of the pots were huge, were really, really big. Um, so it was not just for cooking, but even they have uh, human remains in some of the larger pots, wow. which uh, signifies the fact that, yes, that some of these pots uh, were used for ceremonies. Yeah, wow. Okay. They must have been huge, really huge. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, mm. And so you've had a chance to look at some of them in the museums that you've worked in. Yes. Right? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some, some of the uh, so some of the um, some of the pots um, that I found at the Singatoka Sand Dunes are now kept at the Auckland um, Museum. Uh, so those of you who are listening in from New Zealand, they can also see some of these pots at the Auckland Museum and Te Papa in Wellington. Uh, most of those pots that are collected in those two museums were excavated by Lawrence and Helen Burks um, at the Singatoka Sand Dunes. So they still held there, they well looked after, 
uh, they in good shape. Um, and so I've been really, really privileged to um, you know, excavate some of these ports and looked after some of these ports and also worked with uh, Professor David Burley uh, from the Simon Fraser University in Canada. Uh, he also worked with us in Sinatoka. Um, yeah, he, a lot of archeologists that I've worked with um, have really provided a lot of wonderful evidence for us in Fiji to, yeah, to I think to be proud of our pottery tradition. Uh, you know, even though a lot of us like, oh, that's what my grandmother used to make and, and they leave it there. But if you study it further, then you'll appreciate your own history better. Yes, and how how old it is. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely thousands of years. That's amazing. Actually, most of them they have to be scientists because you have to have the right kind of clay, and you have to know your sand, and then you have to make your own furnace. Mm. Really? Okay, so that's all fired, um, fired clay kind of. Wow. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, cool. All right, so let me see if I've got any more slides. I think this is about it. Whoop. Um, oh, yes, here we go. So, Vanaka, um, thank you to everyone for listening in. If you're listening in, sorry that the comments from Facebook don't come up for me when we're on the Zoom. So, we'll, but I'm sure if there are any there that you and I will be able to get into those later. And, um, and I'll send you the file again, Dr. Tarisi, so you can put it up on your YouTube channel um, or your son can do it for you, get him to do the, the clicking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but it's so, it. yeah, me too. And I'm so glad and, um, and so appreciate hearing more about your research because um, yeah, you always have such interesting things to say and I, um, I get so excited hearing about your adventures in Singatoka and, and all that kind of work that you've done um, in particular. But yeah, it's just um, so nice working with you <laughs> on this. Mm. And um, even though we're in different time zones, it makes me feel like we're not so far apart. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, um, yeah, let's work out, out the, our next session and um, we'll keep everyone else posted as well. All right. This is a Kirsty. I really appreciate the the time and the effort. And sorry about this noises everywhere, back and uh, all over, because our these children in our neighborhood that are playing some music, uh, uh -huh. because they've been uh, they've been uh, what do you call studying at home because of COVID, as you know, which is happening yeah. in Melbourne too. So I had to close the window. And then my family they're calling me because they want me all of us to go to the farm. Oh. And so I told them, just wait, uh, I'll finish my class and then we'll all go to the farm. <laughs> yeah, I will have a beautiful evening and um, yeah, don't be sorry because I think if people play music, that's the best sound ever. The time, obviously, it's time for us to go and relax a little bit and do something nice. <laughs> oh, Vinaka Vale, Dr. Kirsty. Vinaka, Mate Manda. Okay, Mate.